welcome to the election show. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer. I'm an associate professor of political science at Fordham University and the co-host of the FAQ NYC podcast. Joining me today, as always, are two of my favorite people, Matt McDermott, communication strategist and vice president of Whitman Insight Strategies. And also with us today is political analyst and professor of political science at Columbia University, Lincoln Mitchell. How are you? Hanging in there. <laughs> yes, we live to fight another day. Matt, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Lincoln's on the West Coast right now, but most Americans woke up to the news that the president and the first lady have tested positive for the coronavirus. Immediately following that news, many Americans uh, do not take it as fact, just because this president has a, a long history of lying and fudging the truth. Uh, over 210,000 Americans have already died. We'll get to the debate performance uh, in a moment, but some uh, just find it hard to believe uh, because his debate performance was so abysmal. They think that this is a distraction and, de and a deflection tactic. What say you, Matt? Look, I, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, and, and frankly, Just the I ones that are appropriate for television. You're right. <laughs> uh, I, I have been left thinking since first hearing this news uh, about a lot of people, about uh, the essential workers in the White House, in the kitchen staff, and the cleaning staff who were put in harm's way because of the incompetence of this administration, thinking about the Air Force One staff, the airport staff in places like Wisconsin, where the president held an event uh, earlier this week after the debate, uh, thinking of people in New Jersey, where the president uh, on Thursday night, knowing that he was showing symptoms, held a fundraiser at his private golf course. I mean, just the sheer negligence of this administration and the Trump family in particular, after finding out that members of their immediate circle came down with the coronavirus is just unbelievable. We had a Biden family sitting in a debate hall for an hour and a half earlier this week, sitting next to a Trump family that refused to wear masks. And now 48 hours later, two of the members of that family have come down as positive with the coronavirus. It's just beyond belief that we have a White House that has refused to accept the reality and the severity of this situation, and now they're facing it firsthand. I, I mean, I, I think more than anything else, this election has always been about uh, the incompetence of this administration and the inability to grapple with the crises that we face. We are sitting here now, four weeks out from the election, with over 200,000 Americans dead, with millions who have been unnecessarily sickened by this disease. And I, I think as we move forward, obviously the president coming down with coronavirus is going to put that first and foremost on the issue of voters. And I hope every voter sitting at home today thinking about how this situation would have been different if we had a different person leading us. Because it's, it's just unacceptable that we've all had to live through these many months of just incompetent leadership when literally all that needed to happen is people need to wear a mask. And the right. Trump family was unable to do that throughout this entire situation. Well, I mean, Lincoln, Matt talks about the negligence and the recklessness of the president. We also heard the president at the debate mock former Vice President Joe Biden for wearing a mask. He said that, you know, you put on the biggest mask ever, even if someone's 200 feet away. We also saw after the debate when Jill Biden and uh, Dr. Jill Biden, I should say, and Melania Trump came to stage to hug their respective husbands. Obviously, Melania Trump said hello. Uh, but Jill Biden was wearing a mask as she hugged Joe Biden, and Melania Trump was not. So to Matt's point, we see the Biden uh, camp and the Democratic uh, operatives around him taking this very seriously because they come into contact, not just at, at events, but staff members who are driving them, who are opening doors for them as they go into to various buildings. Uh, what do you think about the news that the president, well, I should say, possibly has coronavirus because we don't have any confirmation from legitimate doctors, I don't believe. We have confirmation from his inner circle. And sadly, the, the lies that have come out of this White House have been so fast and so furious, uh, it's leaving many people to wonder whether or not this is just making for good TV, which is what the president tends to well, enjoy. I'm in San Francisco now. And if you walk from where I am west for about 15 minutes, you'll come across a post office. That post office was built around 1990 when the building that was there before collapsed in an earthquake. That building that collapsed was home to the People's Temple. 
And right now, Jim Jones is a friendly neighborhood pastor compared to this cult leader, Donald Trump. He has, his policies on COVID have led to crimes against humanity on a massive scale. First of all, when I hear the news that Donald Trump has COVID, I think of the 200 odd thousand Americans who've already died, who never hurt other people, never wrought the destruction on their lives that Donald Trump did. So that is to me just the first place I go. And I very much agree with the, the absolute recklessness. And I would just add the ad adjective murderous. He is, he and the people around him are knowingly killing Americans because they think they might get a slight political advantage. So this question of whether it is true or not, we don't know. We, what we do know is that it's completely within Trump's kind of political mind, and I use that word mind lightly, to lie about this for political advantage. We know that. I mean, the political advantage is obvious. You get out of the debates. You can magically get better in two weeks, right? Then you can say, look how tough I am. I don't know that that moves voters, but it makes him feel good. And what we know about the uh, Vichy Republicans around Trump is that their goal is to make him feel good in the moment. That's their goal. Here's what I would suggest. Rather than speculate, because the three of us and all of our friends and family and political contacts can talk about this forever, let's look at some data points which will emerge in the next few days. First, do we have evidence that the symptoms are getting worse? If we do, then we know that he has COVID and we should recognize that, right? Secondly, do we have a doctor that is not affiliated with the White House that, that, that can you know, demonstrate this or you know, back this up? And third, do others around Donald Trump start testing, who have been around Donald Trump start testing positive? We know, as Matt indicated, suggested that the mask policy in the White House is not exactly enforced, right? So if other people in the White House start getting sick, yeah, I think Donald Trump probably has tested positive. But if they don't, then this is just another one of his lies. And, and at the end of the day, like we have to, I don't know that this changes anything politically. And we also have to be clear here that, that Donald, that, that if he does have COVID, other Americans will die, not just for the reasons Matt outlined, but because resources will go to him. And this is a moment where yeah, that is, that is in any kind of moral balance, not right. It is not yeah, right. Let me, just, let me just follow up on that though. Cause I, yeah. I, I mean, look, but this is a man who has built his entire career around looking like a strong man, mm -hmm. around looking okay. like he's someone who he's not. The idea that a few weeks before the election, he wanted to get coronavirus is sort of silly on its face. I mean, it, it makes him look like He's been lying about the severity of the problem that we've been facing forever. But I think the issue we have here in this conversation, and, and I think Lincoln, you, you really sort of hit the nail on the head with this point, is this is an administration that has lied to the American people for years. I mean, so literally, much so. literally the second day of this administration, we had the press secretary on national TV lying about the number of people who showed up at their inauguration. This is why transparency in our government is important. Because when we get into these situations, we are facing a national security issue now because no one in this administration holds people accountable and no one is transparent to the American people about what is actually happening to the President of the United States. So Matt, I wanna stick with you because uh, we know that the carnival barking, the entertainment uh, factor of this president has, has been a staple in his administration. I wanna shift a little bit to the debate Yep. Because part of this conversation is about, does the president want to deflect, right? He wants to deflect from the unemployment numbers. He wants to deflect from the recession. He wants to deflect from the over 200,000 Americans who have died. And that's just not people. Those are communities and families who no longer have someone. As Joe Biden said, there's an empty seat at many kitchen tables because of the incompetence of the president. During the debate, the president was unable to listen, he was unable to get out of his own boorish, brutish behavior. Many people say that's just who he is. Many people say that that's uh, the performance that he needed to, to exhibit to show that he was strong and he's the alpha male and that Joe Biden was weak. And then others, even in his own administration, were so incredibly frustrated because they had talking points that could have weakened Joe Biden. They had people in the audience that Donald Trump could have pointed to to show some of his successes on various policy points criminal justice being one where we know that Joe Biden in the past has faltered. So this president seems incompetent 
uh, and incapable of getting out of his own way, even when people have set things up. What was your gut reaction uh, to the debate besides sheer embarrassment? I know I can speak for you and say that it was sheer embarrassment. Uh, sadly, I'll talk to you all about uh, the, the chain, the text chain that I had with my students and they were so embarrassed and so discouraged and so disgusted with our democracy. But Matt, I wanna get your initial thoughts on watching the debate. Uh, we had to do it for our jobs. I quite honestly told friends and family, you can turn away. This is this train wreck. Uh, we are simultaneously on the, the train wreck and also on the tracks. How is that possible? What are your, what's your gut analysis post debate that we're yeah, still so processing? Right, so the difficulty for Donald Trump in this debate is most Americans came into it thinking three things about Donald Trump. One, that he's a liar. Two, that he's incompetent. And three, that he just fundamentally doesn't care about the everyday American. Nothing about Donald Trump's debate performance allayed any of those concerns. And if anything, his debate performance just hardened those concerns among anyone that watched it and saw the performance that he put forward. Uh, the difficulty for Donald Trump, both in the debate, but frankly, in this campaign, is just there's not a lot of room for error. Unlike 2016, there just are not many undecided voters in this electorate right now. An overwhelming majority of Americans have made up their minds. They're either sticking with the Trump train or they're getting the heck off of it. Um, and so the difficulty with Donald Trump is you need to put up a debate performance that actually speaks to people in the middle, to swing voters that are still considering your presidency for another four years. He did the opposite of that. And so I, I think we saw in the aftermath of that, uh, really sort of a, a, a consensus among the punditry, among the conventional wisdom in the talking class that it was just an abject failure for him of a debate performance because he certainly didn't move the needle. And if anything, in the polling that's been done since that debate, you saw Joe Biden not only win that debate, but most importantly, I think, come across as empathetic because that is the one thing that is missing from this presidency today just a belief in the need to care about our people. And I, I think Joe Biden on the flip side put in a, a you know, decent debate performance, but I think more than anything else, you know, sort of thinking more about the coronavirus, I, it just still sticks with me, you know, one of the metrics that, that he reflected on in the debate that at first I thought was just not true. I thought he misspoke. Uh, and he said that one in a thousand black Americans have died from coronavirus in the past six months. I heard that statistic and literally thought it was not true. I thought he was just misspeaking. Maybe he meant 100,000, maybe he meant a million. Turns out he was right. One in a thousand African-Americans in the United States have died from coronavirus under Donald Trump. If that is not an indictment on this administration and the messaging that putting forth, I, I don't know what is. So Matt or um, Lincoln, I don't want to stay on the debate for too, too long because I do want to make sure we discuss the tax story that broke as well. I mean, there's so many stories right. in the six days that we're not together, but I do want to give you an, uh, a chance to respond to uh, some of Matt's points that he made about the debate performances. A couple of things about the debate. It's very clear that Donald Trump, I don't think, won over a single new voter in that debate. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's won over a single new voter in several months. But we saw in that debate was, again, that Donald Trump is not trying to win this election in the sense of win a free and fair election. His goal is to keep his base mobilized and angry and ready to take to the streets to keep him in power after he loses. I don't know that he could have been any more explicit about that, particularly in the last third or so of the debate. Proud boys stand back and stand by when asked to denounce white supremacy. And parenthetically, why is that a question? What happens if he denounces it? Does that make him not a racist? Does that undo his white supremacist administration? There's no verbal get out of jail free card with racism. So I thought it was an absurd question. And he still answered it very honestly by rallying white supremacist base to violently defend him after he loses the election. That is what he is doing every day because he cannot win. There is no way an incumbent president with this performance can win the election. And he knows that, and that is what his campaign is about. And how this COVID test fits in, I don't know, but that's what that debate was. It was no effort to win a new voter. The last thing about the debate is we have to be a little bit forthright about this. What you saw on stage was that the President of the United States is a sociopath. The President of the United States is not capable, forget empathy, 
It is as if he doesn't realize there is another person in the world. Every question is about him. Everything is about him. He is unable. His syntax was actually pretty good by his standards. If you look at the, if you read the transcript, there's a few complete sentences that are grammatically correct. And that's unusual for Donald Trump, right? But we saw some of that, but his complete, you know, the best liar is someone who in the moment believes he's telling the truth. And yes. Donald Trump is a good liar because he always believes he's telling the truth. But th this notion that you could fact check that debate, all you would do is as soon as he opened mouth, his, open, his mouth would put up a red flag and say he's lying. Right. That, but it is a sociopath. And if Joe Biden wins this election 70 to 30, it will still be terrifying to me to live in a country where 30% would vote for Donald Trump. Right. It's, I mean, his lying is almost a, a, the air that he breathes. And I think he fundamentally does believe uh, most of the things he says. I'm always fascinated where he will memorize a statistic and you know, let's just say it's 40%, uh, even in conversations like 40, 50, 60, 80%. I mean, he just ups it in his head because he's, he's accustomed to upselling. It's also the big lies, right? It's this, I built the greatest economy. And, he, and most Americans now believe that because the media never held him accountable for that, which is an outright lie. It's the weird lies sourced from weird right-wing places. The mayor of Moscow gave three and a half, wife gave three and a half million bucks to Hunter Biden. That's just not true. And, I, and I'm not, no admirer of Hunter Biden, who I think is a sleazy guy, but that's a lie. So we just saw, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, almost a display, a lesson in how to lie. Because there's so many different lies sourced from different places, told right. in different ways. But they're so quick and they're so they're uh, such in such abundance. It's very difficult. And also, I blame the media because they report on his lies as though they're they're possibilities. And so maybe we should just you know discuss them. And there's there are far too many media outlets that won't just nip it in the bud. But I do want to shift just a little bit because right before the debate, just a few days before Matt, uh, the New York Times put out a, a very thorough and detailed story that they've been working on for quite some time about the president's taxes. The uh, idea that he has possibly paid no taxes certain years, uh, in, in years that he's been in the Oval Office, he's paid $750, which is far less than the vast majority of Americans. It's less than undocumented uh, folks who are living in the United States. Uh, and the president, of course, says it's a lie, and he's under an audit. He doesn't want to talk about the, the audit, which is a $72 million a refund he received from the, the government. So he keeps saying my taxes are so complicated because I'm so wealthy, so many businesses, and uh, that's why you haven't seen my taxes. One of the first presidents in modern history, say I think the last eight presidents. But also the Republican talking points immediately came out to deflect the story to be, it's illegal that someone uh, you know, broke into his taxes. That person should be investigated. Not the fact that we possibly have the leader of the United States of America who has not paid his fair share, is not remotely paid into this this nation that pays for police, fire, military, school, roads. I mean, the list goes on and on. This is why we pay taxes. It's why I happily pay taxes, because I actually do want to function in society. So what do you say about that story? And what do you think the Democrats, as a strategist, should do to make that still be a story in the news? Because it came out five days ago, but we've all but forgotten about the tax story uh, as, a, as a news cycle. And I, I, for me, at least, I think one of the interesting things about this tax story is the reaction to it, which largely has been along the lines of, well, this just once again confirms that Donald Trump is a phony, which is true. But honestly, the, the bigger news story out of this tax release by the New York Times is around the audit that you mentioned, because quite honestly, it's not an audit. What's actually happening here is the federal government is essentially investigating Donald Trump, the president of the United States, for tax fraud. They are investigating the president for, you mentioned the number, just over $70 million in taxes that weren't paid, uh, which is a crime. And so what's so interesting about this tax story is the conversation after the fact has been, well, you know, some people say this, Donald Trump denies it, maybe he paid taxes, maybe he didn't. The bigger news story is that there's a federal crime sitting right out in front of us that Donald Trump could very well be prosecuted for the second he leaves office. And, and that is just really the summation of this entire presidency, because there's now been a half dozen of these different situations. The tax audit, the Stormy Daniels payment in 2016 before the election, there are now federal investigations that we know for a factor sitting out there in which the president hasn't been indicted for a crime because he's sitting in the White House. One 
I hope moving forward, if Donald Trump does lose this election, that those investigations move forward for the sanctity of our government. But two, I hope moving forward, we start thinking about what protocols we need to put in place to ensure this never happens again. Because it is unacceptable that we have a president who's been sitting in the White House, who otherwise should be facing trial for crimes that he may have committed, and instead he's unable to be tried on those because he's president. That is just not a system of government that I want, and I would hope it's not a system of government that anyone in this country would want to see moving forward. So Lincoln, I mean, building off of what Matt has just laid out for us, you know, with the president is Texas, it seems like what's shielding him right now is literally the White House and the office of the presidency. He's looking at civil and criminal lawsuits uh, if he leaves. He's looking at lawsuits from the Manhattan District Attorney in New York. He's also looking at lawsuits from the Attorney General in the state of New York to say nothing about possibly New Jersey or any other place where he's had business deals. What did you make of the tax story that was quite robust, but immediately uh, almost fell out of the news cycle because of the onslaught of nonsense and drama? Well, a few things. One, what Matt said is, is accurate and it underscores a fundamental tr truth about the Trump presidency. In fact, going back to the Trump campaign, Trump knows that if he leaves office, he faces criminal prosecution. That's even more clear now than it was a month ago. It is hard to imagine a post-presidential life of Trump that doesn't involve, at the very best for him, a lifetime in the courtroom and at the worst doing time. And that means he will do anything to stay in, to stay in office. The second thing is that, again, I'm not a tax expert, but my accountant is, and I have some idea how taxes work, right? It is not just the tax evasion here. It is also the real estate fraud, which will particularly in, in, in the state of New York, which is a real problem, right? But we also see a, a couple of other things if, that we'll learn more about. One, he doesn't really give to charity. And when he does, it's kind of a grift where it's just moving money around. Secondly, he owes a lot, lot of money. And real estate is a debt game, right? It's always about managing debt. Who does he owe that money to? How much does he owe? And what are the terms of that? That's hugely important. That's, in fact, politically, the story that maybe the Times, I think the Times is trying to get it absolutely right because they know it's under scrutiny, so it takes time and that's fine. But there's a lot more here. This will come out. Now, for Donald Trump, what this means is that he is, there is no future. And moreover, for the three or four people he cares about, and that's Ivanka and, I don't know, maybe one or two of his grandkids. I mean, Don and Eric are just still desperately and publicly and humiliatingly trying to get their father's love. And even on Twitter, it's, it's painful to watch. But they're also going to face the consequences for being involved in this criminal operation. And that is something that, that Trump, you know, he, he, if he leaves office, there's no, you know, painting watercolors and photobombing people at baseball games like George uh, W. Bush does or doing good works like, you know, uh, Jimmy Carter, who turned 96 the other day, still does. So this actually makes this a more dangerous situation going into the last month of this election campaign. So looking forward then, what do we have to look forward uh, to? We have the vice presidential debates next week. Some people are saying that they should be virtual just for the protection of Mike Pence and also Senator Kamala Harris. Do you all think that we will even have uh, presidential debates uh, at all. I mean, we know that they were supposed to be the third and, and possibly the fourth week of, of October. Uh, Matt, what would you advise as a strategy moving forward? Look, I mean, we'll see. Uh, Joe Biden was certainly benefited from the first debate. I would expect he would be willing and, and interested in participating in future ones, as would Senator Harris, uh, in part because uh, they've done well with that time in the public eye to make their case to voters uh, why Donald Trump needs to be ousted from office. I think the, the more interesting thing for me over the next week or so is looking at some of these fundraising numbers in Senate races that really haven't been on the radar. We've seen over the last day or so just eye-popping fundraising numbers coming out of places like South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi, Kansas, Alaska. Those are Senate races which honestly should not be really competitive at all. And they are. Uh, and so something's happening here beyond a mobilization of base Democrats to be able to raise the sums of money that are happening. And so I, I think between that and the early vote that is already underway, we're going to start seeing in the next week some signs of what this electorate might look like. And so far, it's, a, it's honestly, just candidly, a very promising picture for Democrats. Mm -hmm. Down ballot races, especially. I think so many people 
consistently focus on the top of the ticket, which is incredibly important as we have seen. But Lincoln, as Matt mentions, I mean, we've got all 435 members of the House who are up. Many Democrats are still solidly in their districts. But these Senate races, we have one third of the Senate that's up. And in key states, Georgia is now solidly purple. Thank you, Stacey Abrams. Uh, and those are two competitive Senate races. And as he mentioned, South Carolina, Lindsey Graham, a veteran uh, senator who's very powerful uh, in the Republican Party, is in the, in the fight for his career. What do you think? Well, I'm going to be a little less optimistic. I, I very much agree. Here's where I agree with Matt. If this is a free and fair and democratic election, it's going to be a landslide. You're going to see Biden win easily. And you're going to see some of these states, Alaska, I don't know if we mentioned that, could break Democrat or at least be very, very competitive. So it's going to be a very good year for the Democrats. But I want to just like two things. First, with regards to future debates, there's 330 million Americans, roughly speaking. Go out and find three that were walking away Tuesday night saying, what we need is more of this, right? Um, so, so there's no appetite for it. I know that I would much rather watch the baseball playoffs than the debate. But what, and the Yankees are making it to the next round, so that isn't that an incentive. Um, but, but one thing that I'm watching and talking to people about is the militias, uh, the right-wing militias who having taken the sign from their commander-in-chief but also the overlap between those militias and the security forces, the people who are active and retired military who are involved in militias, we're on the cusp of a potentially very violent situation. And a president-elect Joe Biden, if things go really well in early November, the first thing he has to do before he takes office is to bring the temperature down there. Can you pivot and talk about the alarm that you've been ringing, which is that of voter suppression? And if we did have free and fair elections, that would be a different conversation. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your, your thoughts on voter Very suppression quickly. right now? You heard it explicitly from Trump. You heard him lay out how he was going to do this. Bad things are happening in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a heavily Democratic, heavily African-American city in a swing state. We're going to send people in. That means we're going to send thugs to harass voters. That's the in-your-face voter suppression. There's also the efforts to throw ballots out, to continue to see doubts about any absentee ballots, and that to give Trump the opportunity to go on and say he won on election night. And if the majority of Americans don't believe him, but 30% do, we're in a potentially very violent situation because the Republican Party will back Trump. Matt, I want to give you just the last word, 30 seconds. Uh, what are you looking forward to in the next week? I mean, I know it's hard to predict a news cycle, but what are you keeping your ears open for? Uh, yeah, beyond more Americans wearing a mask and realizing the severity of the crisis we're in, uh, I think it's Joe Biden elevating this conversation uh, and really bringing home why this election is so important. I, I think, you know, we've talked about this before. I, I think the everyday person like you and I just has difficulty wrapping our, our heads around just how large these crises are. We saw job numbers out today that are frankly abysmal. Uh, and so this is a crisis that is affecting everyone from the president on down to people like us. Uh, and I think Joe Biden really has an ability in the next week to make that case to voters nationally. Gentlemen, uh, thanks. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Dr. Christina Greer, and thank you so much for watching the election show. Goodbye. <laughs>